Uh, you have not returned to me. Amos chapter 4, verses 9 through 11 will be our text, but also we're going to be making some application to our current day situation. But I want to thank Kai for reading Psalm 84. Go back and look at that again. It's a plea by the psalmist to be able to worship God in his house again. And though the psalmist may have had the temple in Jerusalem in mind, we all know that we worship God in a spiritual temple in spiritual Jerusalem. Uh, but we can make an application to pray for the time when we can all assemble together as we used to always do my entire life prior to this event. Uh, and so we miss being together. We miss handshakes, hugs, talking to one another, seeing each other, and hopefully in time that will pass and it will be a distant memory. But for now, it's very real and quite painful. But in Amos chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, I put this sermon out this week because it deals with a subject that may be on some of our minds, and that is, is this coronavirus pandemic a case of God judging America or God judging us? We can never know for sure because there's about three possibilities we can look at. One is it could be God punishing us because we have forsaken him. It could also be, as in the book of Job, Satan being allowed by God to afflict us just uh, for his own honorary purposes. And the third one is it could just be a coincidence because people have not practiced good health measures and it has spread throughout the world. Uh, this has happened before in the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. Millions of people were killed, and so it could be something like that. So the question is, well, how do I know which one this is? Well, let's think about that for a moment. And uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, number one, God does judge nations. He always has and he always will. So keep that point in mind. He judges America. Uh, America deserves divine judgment. If I were to say, well... Now, why in the Old Testament did God judge this nation or that nation? And God very specifically tells you in books like Daniel, uh, also in Ezekiel, Jeremiah, parts of Isaiah, all of these Old Testament books speak specifically as to why God judges people and nations. The book of Amos that we're looking at this morning is full of judgments against Israel and Judah and some of the surrounding communities. We'll talk about that as we go along. So what would be a reason for why America might be judged and punished? Well, we put up with abortion way too long. We've defended that on the basis of a, a woman's right to protect herself, but in reality it's the murder of unborn children. Uh, the alcohol industry in recent years has just exploded, even to the point where people are making their own uh, individual kind of beer, and it's being advertised, promoted as something good. But if you study the statistics, alcoholism and the alcohol itself industry is a very prosperous but also very difficult and terrible uh, thing that has fallen upon our country. And so the fact that we're promoting it even more than ever would be another reason God could judge this nation. Then think about all the sexual sins that we're guilty of. Fornication, people living together without the benefit of marriage. Uh, adultery. Unscriptural marriages after husbands and wives get tired of each other and they just say, well, I'm tired of you. I'm going to get rid of wife number one and get wife number two or husband one and husband number two. And then on top of that, we have uh, homosexuality. Then we have uh, all kinds of perversions like transgenderism. And so all of these are wrong. And even though God doesn't physically judge us now, that doesn't mean that he won't judge this nation in his time. Furthermore, we have legislated God out of our public conscience. And I want you to notice something in this pandemic that I've noticed, and maybe you have as well. And if I'm wrong about this, point it out. But I have heard very little, if anything at all, about God during this last four weeks. And that's different than it has been our previous past. If you'll remember when the terrible tragedy of the uh, Challenger space shuttle that exploded. Ronald Reagan met with the families and called on the nation to pray to God and even led a wonderful lesson in prayer where he said the Challenger people who died in that event had gone into heaven and touched the face of God. Beautiful statement, very eloquently put, 
but it showed our dependence on God and how we look to him for help in times of trouble. Then in 2001, when the 9-11 attack hit the uh, United States in New York City and 3,000 people died, the whole country went into mourning and we all were called upon in every different faith and religion to pray to our God and to pray for help. And America did that for a period of time. Probably six months went by before uh, we quit talking about God. But in this recent pandemic, I've heard absolutely nothing by the leaders of our land or by the um, state legislature, by the governor, by the mayor of the city. If you've heard something that, where people said, let's pray to God and ask him to help us, then let me know because I haven't heard that. And to me, that's a major shift in the last 20 years where we're really taking God out of our conscience already. We've already taken God out of the schools to the best of our ability. We've done that on the basis of, well, separation of church and state. That's another false claim that our Constitution does not support. And now we're so away from God that we're not even bringing him up during this period of time. So that's there. Violence has increased. And so Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. That's always been the case. If you study the Bible, it is a book of man apostatizing from God over and over and over again. Adam and Eve disobeyed and were cast out of God's presence. Then you have the Nate, the world just fully engulfed in evil in Noah's day, and God destroys the whole world except for eight people. And then it happens again in the Tower of Babel. And then it happens again when God has to choose Abraham and his descendants to carry out his scheme of redemption to the entire world through one family. So over and over again we see individuals, families, nations turning away from God and suffering terrible consequences because of it. And so just because God hasn't judged us for abortion or judged us for our alcohol industry or judged us for our sexual perversions doesn't mean that God approves of it or that it's okay. And so keep that in mind. We think, well, I'm getting away with it. God said, just because I don't punish you speedily doesn't mean that you should set your heart to fully do evil. And yet that's exactly where we are today in our country. So with that in mind... In the book of Amos, God warned Israel through the prophet Amos. Interestingly, Amos was a sheep herder from a small town called Tekoa, south of Judah, or excuse me, Jerusalem. Six miles south of Bethlehem, 12 miles south of, of Jerusalem. That may not mean anything to you, except keep in mind that he's prophesying to the northern ten tribes of Israel. After the death of Solomon, the empire, the nation of Israel, Divided, and you had the ten tribes go north and were led by Jeroboam, and then the southern nation of Judah and Benjamin and a few others worshiped God from the south in the temple of Jerusalem called Judah. So, why would God call a man Amos, who's not a prophet or a, a preacher? He's a sheep herder, he's out minding his sheep, he's a trimmer of, of vegetables, of figs. And you know, he says, I want you, Amos, in your rough, outdoors kind of attitude to go up to the nation of Israel and prophesy against these people. God called him to warn, and yet from the rugged wilderness of Judea, he was untainted by society. The date for this book is around 760 to 750 B.C., and that's significant because Jeroboam was the king of Israel at that time, but in 721 B.C., the nation of Israel was destroyed. So here's Amos giving a warning to this nation about 30 years before it was annihilated by the empire of Assyria. It's just a little, about 120 years before the study of the book of Daniel that we're going in our Bible class. But God warns them through Amos, and they didn't listen. And I want you to notice what God says to them through Amos. And the reason we're doing this is because Romans 15, 4 says, Whatever things were written afore were written for our learning, that we through patience, and boy, we need that now, don't we? Patience through this event, and comfort of the scriptures, faith in God's word and what he's doing behind the scenes is very comforting. 
might give us what? Hope. Hope in the life that now is and also hope in the world to come. All right, well, God does warn nations. For example, in Amos chapter 4 and verse 6, God tells Israel through Amos, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Now watch this phrase because it comes up over and over again. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent you a famine. Well, how would you know that came from God? You wouldn't. We've had famines in this country before. We've had drought before. And so God is telling them through Amos, I sent that famine. You people suffered because of it. I gave you cleanness of teeth. I remember when I lived in Kilgore, Texas, I was going to the dentist one time and uh, he was working on one of my teeth. And I told him, I said, man, I said, that tooth that you fixed looks good as new. And to his credit, he said, I can't do that good. He said, I can't make a tooth like God did. And when he said that, I said, well, you know, the Bible talks about God giving Israel cleanness of teeth. Except that wasn't a good thing, that was a bad thing. The reason he gave them cleanness of teeth is because he wanted them to do without their daily food for a little while so they might turn back to him. But he said they did not do it. Again, drought, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He says, I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I just saw in the news this morning that the farmers of America are concerned about their planting crops and being able to harvest because, first of all, the price they're going to get for that is way down because of our pandemic but also because they said this, it's a little more difficult to find the seed and the fertilizer and the different things they need to plant their crops because all of the businesses are way down. So that's something to think about. We hadn't thought about how that might affect us in the fall of the year because America doesn't just feed America. We feed many other countries as well. So you might want to pray for your farmers and pray for our country to make this provision. But God said, I gave you drought so you would have nothing to drink, and yet you still did not turn to me. Well, how about vegetative destruction? Okay, now we have rain. We can plant our crops. But God said, I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. So all of these events by God were done to Israel so they might Come back to him. Then he even goes so far as to say, I gave you Egyptian-like plagues. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword, along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your caps come up in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. And so that's quite interesting because he says an Egyptian-like plague. Well, we remember the ten plagues that caused Pharaoh to finally let God's people go. It also shows you how men can harden their hearts against God. Uh, for example, we remember that Moses turned water to blood in the plague. Then he brought frogs and lice and flies and pestilence. The King James Version calls them moraine. Uh, boils, hail, locust, darkness, and finally the death of the firstborn. Ten plagues it took for Pharaoh to say, okay, God can have his way. And even then when they left, the Israelites left, he changed his mind and went and chased after them into the Red Sea, and he and his army was drowned. But it shows us that man can be very stubborn even in the spite of very difficult circumstances. Chapter 4 and verse 11. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning, Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Here we are at near-death experiences. God says, like a firebrand hanging over the fire, I pulled you out just in time to save your life. By the skin of your teeth you were spared, but you still didn't turn to me. Isn't that sad? And so here's the solemn question for us. So, well, I don't know if this pandemic is from God or if it's punishment by Satan 
or if it's just a coincidence. Well, let me look at it this way. Are you ready? Do we have to know that a calamity is from God before we repent of our sins? Somebody says, well, I'm doing some things wrong, and I know I'm doing them wrong, but I'm going to wait until these pestilences attack me to the point of near death, and then I'll repent. Really? I don't think any of us want to do that, and that's certainly not the right attitude. Well, what should we do? Well, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 to the Christians of Corinth who had many problems spiritually. And Paul's trying to help them with it. But he says, examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Well, how do you test yourselves? You don't go by, well, I feel like I'm okay. Uh, The preacher and the elders haven't said anything to me, so I guess I'm all right. The way we test ourselves and examine ourselves is in the light of God's Word. That's what Israel should have done in Amos' day. We shouldn't need a plague or a near-death experience to bring us back to God. We should turn to God in the days of our youth before the evil days come. And so if you're sitting there listening and wondering this, then my answer to you is whether this came from God or Satan or nobody... You need to examine your heart and be sure you're right with the Lord so that whether this plague affects you or not, you're still right with God because one day God will judge America. One day God will judge you. Again, we read in 1 John 1, 7 through 9, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, you see who our example is? Our example isn't the preacher. Sometimes I fall short. It's not just the elders, although we should follow their godly example. It's not just the weakest member in the church. Well, I'm as good as that weakest Christian who comes once a month. He says, if we walk in the light as Jesus Christ is in the light, there's your standard. Do you live the way Jesus instructed for you to live? He said, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The great thing about being a Christian is when you're baptized of all your past sins, they're gone forever, never to be remembered again. God will not judge you for that and he will not remember that. As a child of God, when we err or fall short or through indifference or neglect fail to do what we should do, we can recognize that by a study of God's Word, renew our enthusiasm and our zeal, turn back to God, ask Him to forgive us as we confess our sins and He'll wash them away again just as clean and as clear as He did the day we came out of the waters of baptism. So we don't need a pandemic in America to cause us to turn back to God. We just need a little self-examination. But Amos had the same problem. In Amos chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, God goes through all of these judgments. He didn't just judge Israel. He gave a section in that book about Judah. He gave another section about the cities of Philistia and Moab and Edom. And so he pronounces judgment on all these nations in the same region. But then in Amos chapter 7, he drives home this point about the plumb line. And it says this, Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. Now for you non-builders, a plumb line is a line with a weight on the end of it, and you hold it up, and it gives you a straight up and down measurement. You can build a wall if you're building a brick wall. I've seen, this is where I've seen the most. Brick layers will put a plumb line down, a a string that's hanging from from a ceiling or a, a high post, and that line gives them a straight line due to gravity, and they can build that brick wall, and it's perfectly straight and perfectly vertical. That's what God is doing here. God's standing by a wall built by a plumb line. What's the point? The Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said to me, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. God said, I have warned you first by all these different pestilences, and I'm warning you by my prophet Amos, 
and you're not turning back to me, so I'm going to judge you by the plumb line of my word, and I will not come back to you anymore. And in 30 years, the nation's gone. So God will use his word as the standard. Not what our politicians say is legal or right. Not what our Eastern religion friends who think that God is within ourselves. Not what they say, but the word of God found by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Impenitence is is a sad thing. But the truth of the matter is that when people become stubborn and they reject God, they do not listen. That was true in Amos' day and that's what God was saying in that particular book. But notice in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17, the sixth seal of God's punishment on the nation of Rome. And I want you to see the comparison. John said, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars fell from the heavens as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? A magnificent picture of God talking about how man is so impenitent that the only time he will scream for relief is when he's running from the final judgment day of God. Notice what he says here. The kings of the earth, the great political leaders, the great men, those who are great in wisdom and knowledge, rich men, the wealthiest among us, commanders of armies, mighty men, and even the slave and free, every human being is powerless against the final judgment of God. And yet because of their impenitence, God has to bring such judgment upon them. Again, we see this in Romans chapter 2 and verse 5, where it says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What God is saying is, just because I do not punish you speedily doesn't mean you can set your heart to do evil. Go back to God's word, humble yourself as the sun melts the butter, and turn to God and say, Lord, forgive me my sins Forgive me of what I've been doing wrong. Help me live a righteous life again. Now the sad thing is, many of the people who need this message will not tune in to any religious service whatsoever. They've made up their minds that religion and Christianity in particular are worthless and that they don't do any good. And yet God is saying all they're doing is preparing an impenitent heart for the sad end of their lives. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 20, which is yet another series of punishments by God. This time, during the sixth trumpet, it says, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues. Now, this book of Revelation, this particular trumpet, one-third of mankind was killed from the earth. Two-thirds were left. Let's think what that would mean to America. Well, the world is about 6 billion people, so if we lost a third, about 2 billion people would die. America is about 300 million people. If a third of us died, we'd lose 100 million people. So that's a severe punishment by God upon wicked and rebellious men. But he said, even those who were alive from this terrible thing did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. So sometimes we think, well, maybe this will bring America to its knees. Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. It hasn't always worked that way, and so we have to keep that in mind. Once again, Revelation 16 and verse 11. Chapter 16 is the bowls of God's wrath, 
And this is the fourth bowl in which it says, They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent their deeds. God poured upon them a blasting heat, and all they did was scream out to God and complain. So that shows you how people in Amos' day failed to repent, how people in the Roman Empire would not turn back to God. Even though Christianity spread like wildfire throughout the empire, the majority of the Roman Empire did not turn back to God. They worshipped Caesar. They worshipped the Roman government. They worshipped the things they could see. They worshipped idols they had built up. But they were very corrupt morally. And so God finally punished the nation. And God one day will punish America. We already have shown you enough sins that America is guilty of that if he wanted to destroy us, Tomorrow he could do that and be fully justified. The only reason why he doesn't is because God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And number two, I'm still convinced that the majority of people in America today, the silent majority we call them, are still good, honest, fairly moral people. And that's what's going to save this country. It won't be our political leaders It won't be the might of our armies. It will be the morals of our citizens. So mom and dad, if you're at home watching, teach your children well because they're the next generation. If you're a grandparent, you're teaching your children and grandchildren, teach them well. There's still hope. There's still time. This country is not lost yet. And if we can't think of coming back to God in a time like this, I don't know what better time there would be. But I do know that As history has shown over and over again, so many, many people have rejected God even in times of trouble. And that's kind of what we're talking about this morning. Well, God finally makes a declaration in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And he says, Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. You want to fight against God? God says, Okay. Let's go. But, you know, when you get in a a fight, you should always sum up your enemy before you get in a battle. Because you might be terribly whipped. And so God gives his credentials for battle. And listen to what they are. He said, For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind. So he shows his omnipotence. I make mountains. I cause the wind to blow. God is the author of tornadoes and hurricanes and the mighty wind. Can you do that? Can you make a mountain? There's such a drastic difference between God's might and man's might that God is saying, I am omnipotent, are you? And of course we're not. Then he says, and creates the wind who declares to man what his thought is. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows your thoughts. How could you defeat God when he knows what you're going to do and you don't know what he's going to do? You can't slip up on God. You can't sneak up behind him. You can't give him a blind sucker punch. God knows all these things and there's nothing you can say, think, or do that he's not aware of already. And he makes the morning darkness. He treads the high places of the earth. Think of Mount Everest. I've watched the movie and read the book about Everest And it takes every ounce of strength that some of these men have climbing Mount Everest to get to the very top peak and then come down again. What amazed me in reading and watching that movie was that more people die after they reach the peak trying to get back down off that mountain because there's so little oxygen, there's so little energy left after you've climbed that the real danger is not getting to the peak, the danger is coming back down. And you know what happens to people who die on Mount Everest? They're laying there to this day, frozen in the snow. People walk by them as they're going up and down the mountain trying to to attain that great feat of making the peak. Well, God says, you know what? When you get up here, I'll be waiting for you. Can you do that? And then he says, finally, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Lord God of hosts, what does that mean? That means I'm the mightiest warrior you've ever met, and I have an innumerable army behind me. Now, if anybody with a little bit of sense could stop and think, do you ever want to get in a fight with somebody who's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, 
and the general of a mighty army that is innumerable, that could defeat all the armies of men combined? And the answer is, no, you don't want to, but some people, in spite of God's warning, do exactly that. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we prepared to meet our God? If not, then now's the time to prepare. The nation of America doesn't obey the gospel. We individually obey the gospel. If you and I want to make America great again, then I have a suggestion. At the conclusion of our lesson, I simply want to say this. We know that in the Old Testament, every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. Hebrews 2.2. And it's not going to change for us today. How shall we escape who have been given the greatest dispensation, dispensation of all? The gospel of Jesus Christ. If we do not trust in God and obey him. Our money says in God we trust. But you and I as individuals must be sure we trust in God by looking to him first. By reading his word. By doing what it says. And as we see corrections that need to be made repent and make those corrections and then we can walk hand in hand with God confident in the future confident in the present and happy as we possibly can be whatever our outward circumstances may be that's what we need to do we don't need to do as I've said before wait till God says in unmistakable terms I'm trying to get you to repent because God did that when he sent Jesus Christ to the cross As Paul said in Acts chapter 17, the times of this ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because his appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. God will judge the world in righteousness. Righteousness is the plumb line. The psalmist said, all God's commandments are righteousness. God will judge the world in righteousness. God will judge the world by his word. Because he has appointed a man by whom he will judge the world, that man Jesus Christ, and the assurance of our future judgment is that he raised Jesus up from the dead never to die again. You will one day be raised either to eternal life or to eternal condemnation. The choice is yours. I hope you reflect on your soul's condition while you take care of your physical condition. The time to repent and straighten up is now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. A passage quoted from Isaiah. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Many people did repent of the preaching of Isaiah. And many people repented the preaching of the apostles and of Jesus Christ and even John the Baptist. If you need to make your life right with God, I pray that you will repent today as well. We thank you for listening this morning. I hope this lesson has been encouraging to you. It certainly has been an encouragement to be with you today. John said in Revelation chapter 1, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And at 5 o'clock tonight, we'll have a lesson about another family who was socially isolated. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Eight souls in the ark. What can we learn about Noah and his family in the ark? Tonight at 5, we'll talk about that. I hope you tune in then.